This morning's Torah portion is called Mishpatim. And Mishpatim means judgments. So there's different kinds of laws in the Torah. And I will share with you the difference of a Mishpat, which is like a moral judgment in how to live with your fellow man versus a hoke, which is something that God asks you to do that's not necessarily logical, but will bring blessings into the life, or an edot, which is a type of law that is a witness uh, to God and to others. So you can find it in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 21, and we'll be covering four chapters this morning through chapter 24, verse 18. And in this parasha, we're going to see in the first chapter the laws of servants and penalties for crimes against others and the compensation that comes when you do something that is uh, hurting your fellow man. In 22, we go into the laws of restitution. And in 23, the laws of being truthful and the laws of the land's rest and the, lands, the laws of the holy days. And then we see a hidden prophecy of Mashiach and God's plan to deal with their enemies. In chapter 24, we see an account of Moshe going up on the mount after six days and receiving God's Torah and instructions. And in chapter 24, verse 12, it's amazing. It lists three things. He says, come up to the mountain where I will give you the tablets of stone along with my Torah and the commandments. So he lists them as three separate things. In our parties, we're going to see some interesting correlations where the plain meaning is Moshe is presenting 53 specific mishpatim. These are these type of laws and how to deal with your fellow man and if you have any areas of conflict, how to deal with them. So we're going to look this morning in these 53 mishpatim and break them down in understanding laws of accountability to one another, laws of compensation, and laws of restitution. And of course, in the Ramez, just beyond the literal, we see glimpses of God's character as the ultimate lawgiver and the righteous judge. He knows how to rightly judge between two people with their issues and how to share with people how to be more selfless with one another. Even if somebody does something wrong to you, where he dealt with Israel coming out of Egypt, he might have said, this person needs to pay you a certain amount and you can expect that this is going to be paid. But as he develops you spiritually, you see Yeshua saying, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you, don't expect anything from anyone, and don't return evil for evil. So we take this understanding of righteous judgments even further in our spiritual walk through Yeshua. We see that Yeshua is the one who teaches us how to treat our fellow man as the Torah made flesh. And the application for us today is, whoever loves his fellow human being has fulfilled the Torah. That's in Romans 13, verse 8. So we are all about not just having a memorization of the Torah, but writing it on our hearts so that it can be naturally lived out. And you can understand that whenever you serve your fellow man, you're serving God. And whenever you forgive your fellow man from a, for a wrong done to you, it opens up your spirit to understanding and receiving God's forgiveness more for you. And this brings healing and health in the life. We're going to see some symbolism in the 22nd chapter where it deals with the six years of slavery and then you set your slave free in the seventh year and liken it to 6,000 years of slavery to sin that we've been going through since Adam and Eve. But we are set free in the seventh millennium, in the year 7,000 when Messiah comes. This is when we begin to be set free by him teaching us Torah and writing it on our hearts. There's some interesting correlations also in that Moshe is presenting 53 mishpatim in this parasha. And if you look at the word Yeshua, who is the living example, the living embodiment of what love looks like in action to your fellow man, to the extent that he even laid down his life, we see that if you spell out Yeshua's name, the letters in the Hebrew alphabet, in the order in which they come, this is a different type of gematria, where normally each letter is given a certain numerical value. But if you just counted from the Aleph as number one, the Beit number two, and so on, all the way through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 
and you see the, the yod is the tenth letter, the sheen is the twenty-second letter, the vav is the sixth letter, and the ayin is the sixteenth letter, it would add up to 53, which tells us there's a correlation between the laws of how to love our fellow man and Yeshua, who came to be the living embodiment of that greatest reflection of God's love. Also, what's interesting, when you look at Torah, the Tav is the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Vav is the 6th, the Resh is the 20th letter, and the He is the 5th. You also get 53. So what an amazing correlation that we see in the laws of love and how to love our fellow man. We see the living embodiment of Torah in Yeshua, living out and exemplifying what this looks like. And he took the Torah even further when he was with his disciples and he was walking this earth. And he says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if anyone even is angry with his brother in his heart, he's committed murder. He took this spiritual principle outside of the application of physically doing something wrong to even thinking wrong. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who lusts in his heart over a woman has already committed adultery. So he's bringing it to a heart and mind connection rather than just a physical reading the letter of the law and waiting till somebody does something wrong acting out on it. So I thought that was a beautiful correlation as well as the word mishpatim. If you go to the regular form of gematria, you would see the mem equals 40, the sheen equals 300, the pei equals 50, the tav equals 9, the yod is 10, and the mem, of course, is 40 again. You would have, in this word, the name of our parasha, a gematria of 479. And what's interesting about this number is it just happens to be the number of years that the Mishkan stood. The Mishkan is the tabernacle that God gave the design to Moshe in the wilderness and that he would take up and down whenever they would move. And for 39 years in the wilderness, because he had them build it, he gave the instructions in the first year and they completed it one year later. So they basically used this 39 years in the wilderness. Then when they entered the land, Joshua set up the altar on Mount Ebal, and there the Mishkan stood for 27 years. And then it was moved to Shiloh, where it stood with, you know, Eli, the priest, and Samuel. This is where they officiated. 369 years, the children of Israel would come to Shiloh and gather around, uh, which is also in Shomron. So this is further north, Mount Ebal. If you look at our map, the Israelites were coming up this area east of the Dead Sea and crossed over the Dead Sea here. Then they had the Battle of Jericho, which is right here, and then they went up here to uh, Mount Ebal, and where Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal are, and that's where the tabernacle stood. Then they came a little bit south, and 369 years it spent in Shiloh. Then it was moved down here to Hebron. And David reigned in Hebron as king after Saul seven years, and the tabernacle stood there. Then when he moved the temple or the tabernacle to Jerusalem, he reigned for another 33 years. And it was in the fourth year of Solomon, his son, that the temple was built, the, the permanent Solomon's temple. And so you can see this migration of the tabernacle coming from Egypt here where Sinai is down here, and traveling all 39 years up here, and then coming back down to the time where the permanent temple was built. And an interesting correlation with Mishpatim because what is the temple all about? It's about God's Shekinah uh, spirit indwelling with man. But man wasn't ready for the Shekinah to fully dwell. He says, build me a tabernacle that I might dwell in them. But they weren't ready to be dwelt in. And so he had this tabernacle, which was a type of our body and of the heavenly tabernacle that was to be a place where these laws of love would be taught from. And so there's a correlation between these laws of love to our fellow man and how we love God and how God can dwell in us with the 479 years that this uh, tabernacle stood. So interesting little correlations that we find even in the gematria. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Exodus chapter 21. 
and we will see these initial laws dealing with accountability in the first 17 verses. We're going to see that in this chapter, it goes from accountability to then dealing with compensation in verse 18 and all the way till the end of the chapter and in chapter 22 it begins to deal with restitution. So we're going to look at taking these literal written laws like we said um, Yeshua did and then move it to a deeper spiritual understanding of the application in our life by looking at some New Testament text uh, in correlation with these. These are the rulings, the mishpatim you are to present to them, God said. If you purchase a Hebrew slave, he is to work six years, but in the seventh, he is to be given his freedom. So right off the bat, he's dealing with the Israelites as slaves that he's redeemed from Egypt. And one of the very first things he teaches them, you might have been treated harshly as a slave. And if you ever take slaves, or if anybody ever does indentured servitude for you to be able to earn money for food or to help their families, don't treat them like you were treated in Egypt. This is one of the reasons why he dealt with the laws of slavery right off the bat. And in Israel, slavery was much different than it was in Egypt. This is where you wouldn't take somebody by force, but somebody would come to you and say, can I work for you for six years? Can I be your servant? And this would be a way that they could take care of their family. And you would treat them like family. You would give them the best of everything. So he deals right away with how to even treat somebody that you're tempted to look down upon as a servant to raise their status up and to show that they're not only equal with you, but they are also free. They're not to be a permanent slave. And you see this principle of six years and then the seventh you're set free, just like the six days of creation and then the seventh day is Shabbat. Us observing the weekly Shabbat is a sign of our freedom in the Lord and the covenant that we uh, are in between Him. And the six uh, symbolic millennial days, like Peter says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, you could draw a correlation between six millennial days of slavery, but the seventh one, which we look forward to, where Messiah will set up his kingdom, is when we will be set free, and at the end of that is when sin and death are destroyed. He says at the seventh, he is to be given his freedom without having to pay anything. If he came single, he is to leave single. If he was married when he came, his wife is to go with him when he leaves. But if his master gave him a wife and she bore him sons or daughters, then the wife and her children will belong to the master and he will have to leave by himself. But there were also laws that the servant didn't have to leave. If he wanted to stay, he could stay like a member of the family. And there was certain... Um, symbol of piercing the ear that would symbolize that you're now a permanent part of the family and kind of a permanent um, worker in the household. <clears throat> Nevertheless, if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, so I don't want to go free, then his master is to bring him before God. And there at the door of the doorpost, his master is to pierce his ear with an awl, and the man will be his servant for life. If a man sells his daughter as a slave, she is not to go free like the men slaves. If her master married her but decide that she's no longer pleasing him, then he is to allow her to be redeemed. He is not allowed to sell her to a foreign people because he has treated her unfairly. So all of these laws of accountability are about treating each other fairly, no matter who you are. If he has her marry his son, then he has to treat her like a daughter. If he marries another wife, he's not to reduce her food, clothing, or marital rights. If he fails to provide her with these three things, she is to be given her freedom without having to pay anything. Whoever attacks a person or causes his death must be put to death. If it was not premeditated but an act of God, then I will designate for you a place that you can flee. These were called cities of refuge. But if someone willfully kills another after deliberate planning, you are to take him even from my altar and put him to death. These cities of refuge were cities, there were six of them around the land in different places, and they were places where the priests lived. So basically this, this person who had accidentally killed somebody, the family might be very angry and want to kill them, but it wasn't really his fault. So there was a place of safety. He would have to attach himself to the high priest in essence, kind of like we attach ourselves to the high priest who's paid the penalty for our errors. And he had to stay there until the high priest died, interestingly enough. There's a lot of symbolism in this with Yeshua. 
But if someone willfully kills another, then that person must pay the penalty. Now it goes into whoever attacks his father or mother must be put to death. This is likened to the commandment in Deuteronomy, you shall not strike your parent. This is God's way of teaching, you know, you're dealing with your fellow man on one capacity, your servants with another capacity, but you must show your parents the utmost respect. Now, out of these 53 laws, these 53 um, laws of accountability and restitution and how to show love to your fellow man, 23 of these that we're reading are positive. They're called imperative uh, mitzvot. That's where he says, you should do this, like love your neighbor as yourself. That's an imperative commandment. It's affirmative. There's times where he has to tell people what not to do also, and those are called negative commandments. Not that they're negative, but they're, they're the, the do nots, you shall not do things. And there's 30 of those in this parasha. Whoever kidnaps somebody must be put to death, regardless of whether he has already sold him or the person is found in his, still in his possession. Whoever curses his father or mother must be put to death. So first you see, attacking your father and mother, then you see even speaking evil about your father and mother. So it's taking it from the act to a little bit further spiritual principle to even speaking it. And then we want to move people to even thinking a negative thought. Now if we look at the laws of accountability, it's, um, well in Joshua 82, he talks about what God gave here at Sinai. It says, Moshe remained with Adonai 40 days and 40 nights, and Adonai instructed him in commandments and judgments to impart is to Israel. And this is what we've been reading, these laws of accountability. And Moshe came to the children of Israel and spoke to them all the words of Adonai. And he taught them the Torah, the mitzvot, and the mishpatim. Three things are listed here in Jasher, as well as what we're going to see in Exodus 24 which Adonai had taught him. So he's teaching what Adonai had taught him, and that's what each of us are called to do. Teach others what we are taught, but not to just speak it. It's more important that we live it first, and then to teach others when they are ready for it. Here's a little overview of these different kinds of commandments in the Torah. There's three, 613 of them, of which some are hukim, some are idot and some are mishpatim, and we're looking at just the mishpatim today. Hukim are not obvious or rational laws. They're what you also see translated in the English as statutes. They're things like sacrifice a red heifer and then burn it on the altar and then take the ashes and mix it with water and th then purify all of the temple uh, furniture and, and bowls with this uh, purification. And they might say, why? What does that have to do with anything being purified? So they're not obvious or rational. Or kashru, these are the laws of um, cleanliness, of like clean foods, or what we would say being kosher. And before science was able to show what a germ looked like or to show what cross-contamination does, you just had to observe these by faith. Or speaking to a rock. What about speaking to a rock is going to bring out water? And what does it symbolize? These are not rational things, but they have great meaning in the spiritual realm. Or even looking at a serpent and being healed. These are different kinds of hoax. An edot is a symb symbolically foreshadowing law, much like each of the holy days symbolically foreshadowed uh, different aspects of Yeshua's ministry, both his first coming and his second coming in the spring and the fall feast. Um, they're called also a witness, just like the Ten Commandments are a witness of the greater 613 laws. And if you looked at the 613 laws in Torah, I'll just do it down here. God is basically making a witness to these, summing up all his laws of love, all the hoax and all the mishpats and all the edots in his Ten Commandments, right? And so you can sum up all of the Torah in these laws of love. And if you break down the Ten Commandments, you see the first five are our laws of how to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the last five are how to love your fellow man. But really, like I just said, loving God and loving your fellow man is two laws that you could sum up all of the 613. But if you take it down even further, 
it all boils down to one law, and that law is the law of God's character. It's the law of all energy in the universe. That is the law of selfless love that emeates out from him as light, and it actually gives birth to new life. So the very aspect of eternal life is returning to this one law of eternal love. Unfortunately, because man is so hardened, <laughs> and the Israel had really been influenced by Egypt after 210 years in slavery, he has to give break down different aspects. If you see this, do this. If you don't see this, do this. And these 613 are just all different aspects of what Israel was dealing with at the time. But it doesn't mean that these are the only laws in the universe. Actually, you could take these 613 and see thousands more principles of selfless love in the universe and how to apply these eternal principles to our life. There's laws of health. There's laws of um, loving your fellow man. There's laws of forgiveness. There's laws of purity. There's laws laws for the priest, there's laws for women, there's laws for being in the land and the agriculture. And ultimately, we want to get to the place where that law of selfless love is so written upon our heart that we don't ever have to refer to the written Torah. This is the goal of the millennial kingdom, a thousand years of having the living Torah, teaching Torah, writing it upon our hearts in fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, where he says, I will write my Torah upon your heart. I'll give you a new heart and a new mind. And so then you're living out all these other laws naturally. So you see these Ten Commandments as being a witness of the greater law, but also reflecting that one law that of selfless love. Zitzit also is a witness. It's a type of edot. But today we're looking at mishpatim, which is judgments when a man had a dispute with another man they would come and present themselves to Moshe and Moshe had to rightly divide the word that's what it means to be a true judge and he would share with them what the application of selfless love was in that case how could it um, be dealt with with God's law and so he would show them from God's law these laws are moral, they're obvious, they're logical, they're rational. They're often laws of relationship. They're laws of charity. They're things like don't steal, don't kill, anything that deals with your fellow man. The hoax require faith. The edots reveal our faithfulness as we are a witness to others. But the mishpatim, they don't require faith because you can see the immediate application. Okay, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do to my fellow man. So we're going to look at, we just looked at 17 verses dealing with accountability, whether you're dealing with a slave or whether you're dealing with your parents. And the next verses, we're going to go into compensation and restitution. And we're going to see this theme being repeated throughout the whole Torah portion. What is accountability? responsibility to our fellow man being able to live with him and to exemplify God's love to him and to deal fairly with him its trustworthiness its honestness its virtuousness its um, stability reliability ethical uh, laws and so when we're thinking of these things that we just dealt with think of how they were all dealing with being accountable to our fellow man whether he's a servant or whether he's your parent Compensation is the act or process of paying someone back for something that either you owe them, like a worker, or something that you've taken from them that you owe, or something they've lent to you and you need to pay back. It's a type of recompense. Whereas restitution is the act of restoring to the rightful owner something that has been taken away, lost, or surrendered. The act of making good or compensating for loss, damage, or injury, or indemnification. So we're going to look at this theme of accountability, compensation, and restitution. These 17 verses that we just looked at, if we take those principles further, he's dealing with Israel that's just come out of slavery, and Egypt probably had issues of less than honor to their parents, and so he's meeting them where they're at. But in the New Testament, we see in Luke 17, Yeshua takes us even further. He says, watch yourselves, be on guard, basically of everything that you think, everything you're tempted to say, because when somebody does something wrong to you, you're tempted to be, what, reactionary, right? But selfless love is proactive. 
It doesn't take account of any wrongs. It doesn't take anything personal. It just loves. For the sake of love alone, it expects nothing in return. So he's warning us in love, watch yourself. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. It's okay to tell them where they've gone wrong. And if they repent, what are we called to do? Forgive them. Now, I would take it even further. Even if they don't repent, what are we to do? Forgive them. Because, see, Yeshua is even meeting them where they're at at that time. But ultimately, the more we understand about God's character of selfless love, we take it even further to the nth degree. And we basically say, God is the judge. And he's also the one that says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? When he says that, it's not because he's going to pay back arbitrarily in punishment. But the principle of his selfless love has a law itself. And that is the law of cause and effect. If somebody's going to do something harmful to somebody else, guess what? It's going to come back in some way or another, whether the negativity causes a health issue or whether they remove themselves from the loss of God's blessing and protection and then the enemy has access to them. In various ways, we don't have to recompense evil for evil. We can release and from our side forgive and be free of all bitterness. And in that, we can be eternal children of light. And there's great healing in letting go and forgiving. And those who hold on to bitterness and, and remember the wrong accounts done against them that get sick because all stress and all bitterness manifests itself as different forms of disease in the life. So he's giving a basic principle here that's a little bit further than the Torah, but we're going to take it even further. In Galatians 6, 1 through 5, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. That's the Spirit of God. But watch yourselves, or you may be tempted. What are you going to be tempted about? Judgment, right? To not restore them gently. To say, good riddance, right? And we have to be so careful to try to seek to restore all people gently. Carry each other's burdens. When we don't care what somebody else is going through or what their perspective is, we're not carrying their burdens. We need to carry their burdens. And in this way, we will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, is the law of Christ anything different than the law of Torah? No. It's only that he's revealed it on a higher spiritual level. So this is what it means that the law of Christ, this is what I was referring to earlier when he says, you have heard it said, he's referring to the written Torah, but I say to you, he's taking it a little bit further. It's nothing new. It's the eternal principle from the beginning. It's just God had to meet Israel where they were at. If anyone thinks, did you have a question? Um, forgiving is actually fair. But yeah. In my experience, what I did for a living, behavior is by a person is often continued. Yes. Using forgiveness as a, a, a tool for them to continue that. Like a crutch or... Um, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll, see, you'll look at it here. You're an enable. And they keep repeating the same pattern, whatever that pattern is. Right. So on an individual level, we forgive. But from a governmental level, like in the kingdom of God, there is cause and effect. And there is certain punishments to teach a person the harmful effects of their wrong actions, whether on themselves or to others. And so we see two different things. On an individual level, we have to make sure to not put ourselves in the place of God's government or to be the judge. And so we can forgive and let go, but the state, they might prosecute somebody for their wrongdoing, and that's just. And God's eternal principles and his energy is such that if you live out of harmony with it, you're removing yourself from the very source of health and blessings and protection, and you're going to reap what you sow. And so there's a type of judgment that comes, even though it's not God arbitrarily doing it, it's just inherent in the laws of the universe. Yes? You know what you talked about? We're talking about Mark Boyd, the Divinity Institute, and they have a parallel to that. Yeah, and there's laws of wisdom as well. So you can be totally free of any bitterness against somebody, but you can choose not to associate with them. And God even exemplified this with Israel. He says, don't give your daughters to the Canaanites, right? I don't want you to intermingle with these pagans and be influenced by them. If you come into you the land and you see a high place, destroy it. So these things are beautiful laws of being a light to the nations, we have to have a separation between that which is holy and that which is 
Yes, and that's where balance and wisdom, we don't have to associate with an evildoer. But are we called to love them? Yes. Do we love their evil? No, but we love the evildoer. And this is the way we begin to walk in the spirit. It says each one should test their own actions. So now the focus is instead of me looking at somebody else and judging them and thinking what they did against me, where's my focus? I'm seeing through God's eyes. I'm not taking my eyes off of God because that's a trap also. If you look at your own shortfallings, you can have guilt and self-condemnation and then you only become like that which you are more through that guilt and self-condemnation. But when you look through God's eyes, you see yourself the way God sees you and you test your own actions and you say, oh, oh, I'm starting to operate in the realm of selfishness or self-seeking. And then you come back to letting go of the flesh and giving yourself over to be a vessel for God's service and to live that selfless love. So this is what it means to test your own actions. The testing begins here in the mind. Long before you hear yourself say something wrong or you see yourself do something wrong, you're checking yourself in your mind saying, oh, is even my intention, I'm saying this to this person, but is there any form of manipulation that's self. Is there any form of coercion? That's self. Is there any form of violence or force, trying to force somebody to do something for my agenda or something I can gain by manipulating my words a certain way? Even before it comes out, you think of your intentions, and this is what it means to test your own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. So let's look at some laws of compensation and then we will take it a little bit further just like we did with accountability. The next uh, verses 18 to 37 to the end of the chapter is talking about compensation in the Hebrew. What was amazing to me this year as I was reading it in the Hebrew, God revealed to me something new that I didn't see last year and that's that this word compensation that's it's translated in the English is not really the same way that we think of compensation. In the Hebrew See, if, if I think of compensation in the English, I think of something you owe me, right? I did this, so you owe me this. But God says to give as a gift. In the Hebrew, this word is natan. So let's look at that, and I'll point out these different places where this Hebrew word natan is used. This is where we get the name Nathan. It means gift of God, or nethanel, nethaniel. If two people fight and one hits the other with a stone or with his fist and the injured party does not die but is confined to his bed, then if he recovers enough to be able to walk around outside, even if with a cane, the attacker will be free of liability. Except, now this word compensation here, to compensate him for the loss of time, is to give him a gift. Now the difference between you're compensating somebody because you've, you've been forced to by the state, right? Or by the government, or by the police, or by the judge. There's a difference if, do I do it because I've begrudgingly been forced to do it? Or do I do it from my heart because I feel so bad about what has happened? I give it naturally as a gift. See the big difference there? One, you're forced to do something. It's not really a heartfelt uh, action. In the Hebrew, this has a heartfelt action of give something, uh, compensate him from the heart uh, as a gift for his loss of time. When you do it that way, you don't have to wait for somebody to impose this upon you by force. You know that, okay, he took you to court and now you're forced to compensate him. You are making things right to the best of your ability and taking responsibility for his care until his recovery is complete. This is the way God's kingdom works. Verse 20, if a person beats his male or female slave with a stick so severely that he dies, he is to be punished. Except that if the slave lives for a day or two, he is not to be punished since the slave is his property. Remember, Moses is dealing with Israel where they're at and the way that they saw Egypt deal with their slaves. This doesn't mean that we deal, you know, that we take slaves and that we beat them or that it's justifying beating them. If people are fighting with each other and happen to hurt a pregnant woman in the process so badly that her unborn child dies, then even if no harm follows, he must be fined. He must natan, give the amount set by the woman's husband and confirmed by the judges. So he's got to give it willingly, even though they're going to determine the amount. 
But if any harm follows, then you are to natan, give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. So this doesn't mean that other people are going to come and take it from you. This means that you should be willing to give of yourself, even to the point of your own life. Now this is a reflection of Yeshua. Burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Remember Isaiah 53? It says, He was bruised for our iniquities. He was beaten for our transgressions. And He gave this as a natan, as a free gift. This is why you see so often in the New Testament, it translated as a free gift, this salvation. If a person hits his male or female slave's eyes and destroys it, he must let him go free in compensation for his eye. If he knocks out his male or female slave's tooth, he must let him go free as a gift for the tooth, or for the tooth's sake would be a better uh, translation here. It's as if everything has value, even everything in the temple of God, which is our body. When it's saying that you must uh, let him go free for, it's not for his sake, the person's sake, but it's actually for the tooth's sake or for the eye's sake. This is how you would read it in the Hebrew. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox is to be stoned and its flesh not eaten. So this would be likened to, or if the owner of the ox um, is negligent and he's used to goring people and he lets them continue to gore people. It's like a drunk driver continuing to um, bring harm to life. However, a ransom may be imposed on him and the death penalty will be commuted if he gives the Natan the amount imposed. If the ox gores a son or a daughter, the same rule applies. If the gore if the ox gores a male or female slave, its owner must natan, once again, give willingly their master 12 ounces of silver, and the ox is to be stoned to death. If a person removes the cover from a well or digs one and fails to cover it, now these are also laws of negligence, and this is where we really need to be accountable proactively, thinking about if not just the body, but every aspect of the body is so important to God and has such value. How can we live in such a way to always make sure to the best of our ability to protect that any, no harm should come to anyone? This is where seatbelt laws come in or um, where we put up a fence around uh, a construction site so that nobody gets hurt or falls off a parapet. It says, the owner of the well, if he didn't cover the well, must make good the loss by compensating the animal's owner, but the dead animal will be his. If one person's ox hurts another so that it dies, they are to sell the ox live, they're to sell the live ox and divide the revenue from the sale, and they're also to divide the dead animal. But if it is known that the ox was in the habit of goring in the past, and the owner did not confine it, he must pay ox for ox, but the dead animal will be his. If someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters or sells it, he is to pay five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. So here we see there are just laws of recompense. If something should happen, and they're supposed to only happen accidentally, but there's still a just um, compensation. Now, in the New Testament, we see in uh, Hebrews 10.30, God saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Why is this? Because if we take matters into our own hands and we go and say, okay, I'm going to get that person if he's, because he's done this to me, then you're not allowing the natural cause and effect and you're breaking one of the laws of love. The way God works, he's not going to arbitrarily bring vengeance, but he's going to allow them to experience the negative consequences of their actions. Proverbs 20, verse 22 says, Don't say, I will get even for this wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. So there's a confirmation that we're on the right track with our thinking. When you look at the whole of the scriptures, where is it taking these Torah principles even further? Solomon was considered to be the wisest man who ever lived. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, 
according to the fruit of their deeds. So this confirms that that which a man sows, that will he also reap. It's not God arbitrarily punishing anyone. He, in the same way with sin in the end, we are alive because of the gift of God through Yeshua. Remember, the wages of sin is what? Romans 6.23. It's the death. And it's not just the first death. It's eternal death. So what's amazing is, in the end, when sin is finally destroyed, and those who hold on to the sin, which is self-seeking in the life, God doesn't even have to punish in the final judgment. All He has to do is give them over to the lust of their heart, which means give them what they have chosen after so long of Him seeking out to reach out to them, and Him even giving His only begotten Son on their behalf. They didn't accept that gift. They didn't uh, adopt His laws of love. And so what happens? Sin, which is self-seeking, is self-destructive. All He has to do is release them, and you can't live in sin. So it's a miracle that any one of us are alive. It testifies to the gift of God, even Hasatan, if you think about it, or the fallen angels. There's a time reserved for their judgment, but when is that judgment? When God finally releases them to, like 1 verse 24, 26 says, God's wrath is giving us over to the lust of our heart. When He does that, then we experience the natural cause and effect of that sin which separates us from the source of life. And it's like pulling a plug on a light bulb, you know, or on a lamp. If you sever yourself from the source of life through sin, and that's what Isaiah 59, 2 says, sin has made a separation between you and your God, then there is no life inherent in sin. It's only because of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world that we are allowed this time to live, to learn how to return to that principle of selfless love. And that's the real miracle. Romans 12, verse 17 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is the higher spiritual principle. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone as much as possible. There's another place that says, Be at peace with all men as much as possible. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. See, we don't even want to be a stumbling block. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now many people not understanding his character could twist this scripture, right? They could misunderstand and think that, oh, he's a vengeful God, that he's just waiting to take the vengeance for himself. And that would be totally attributing evil to that which is good. We know when God is saying that, he's saying, don't you worry about it. He's relieving us of the responsibility to take vengeance. And his way is to let the natural cause and effect happen naturally. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, now he's taking the spiritual principle even further. What do we do? He's our enemy. He wants to kill us. But he got hurt. So, like the Good Samaritan, we bundle him up and we care for him. He's hungry. We find him years later. And because of his wrong practices, he's brought a curse into his life. And he's hungry. Now, we could walk by and see him begging. And we remember years ago, he stole so much from us. Or he hurt us, right? And we could laugh and point the finger and say, you got what you deserve, right? And that's human nature. But what is God's nature? To get down on your knees and to feed him, even though he is your enemy and he's done wrong. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In everything we think, say, and do, we're just exemplifying God's character of selfless love. This is our calling. This is what it means to be an overcomer, to overcome that selfish nature which stems from the ego, which stems from the false identity of thinking that this body is something that we need to protect. It's the Spirit of God that we need to protect, and that is protected by living out acts of kindness and selfless love. He says, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then Paul finishes up by saying, do not, become, do not be overcome by evil, but let us overcome evil with good. Yes. So there's an understanding of that, heaping coals on his head. In the poor areas, somebody that did not have a home, they would have a basket on their head with dirt in it, and they would put coals in there, and they would go from house to house and sell the coals to people to start a fire with when it got cold. So when you heap coals on your head, you're actually blessing them. Blessing on mm -hmm. them to where they would have extra warming now during the cold evenings. 
when it would be cold outside. I love it. I wanted to bring that out, and I could not remember the exact uh, story of that, so I'm glad that you brought that out because well, that's... A.C. Fly, in his books, one of his books, he talks about Orientalisms, and that's where that comes from. Oh, it's beautiful. That's the right principle. What? What's that? Oh, okay. So now in chapter 22, let's look at some of these laws of restitution. If a thief is caught in the act of breaking in and he's beaten to death, it is not murder unless it happens after sunrise. So what is this saying? In the dark of the night, somebody jumps into through your window and you're swinging to protect your family and to protect yourself and you have a right to preserve your own life. Life trumps all in Torah, so you're supposed to protect your family's life. But you don't see what you're doing. You don't see him. You don't see where you're hitting him naturally. So what this means is it's a type of accident. Yes, you're supposed to try to restrain somebody, but you're not supposed to intentionally kill them. So if it's dark, you're excused. If it's past sunrise, it's assumed that you can see because there's light coming in the window, and then you shouldn't hit them in the places that would kill them. So this is the way that this is hinting at this. A thief must make restitution. If he has nothing, he himself is to be sold to make good the loss from the theft. If he stole what is found alive in his possession, he's to pay double. Okay, so here we see a principle of paying 200%, if you will, twice as much. We're going to look at different cases in Torah and also a case in the New Testament where in some cases you pay double. In some cases you add a fifth, which is 20%. And we're going to look at the case of Zacchaeus, which actually gave four times. What's the difference? What we have to discern. If a person causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or lets his animal graze in someone else's field, he is to make restitution from the best produce of his own field and vineyard. If a fire is started and spreads to thorns so that the stacked grain and the standing grain or a field is destroyed because of somebody's negligence, the person who lit it must make restitution. If a person entrusts a neighbor with money or goods, so I'm going on a trip here, I want you to take care of this for me in your house. Meanwhile, while I'm gone, somebody's broken into your house or I come back and you say somebody's broken into your house and sorry, don't know where it's all at. Well, even if they're stolen, this is to prevent people from saying, I'm sorry it was stolen. It says that if the thief is found, he must pay double. But if the thief is not found, then the trustee must state before God that he did not take the person's goods for himself. So they would basically go and present themselves before the temple and make an oath. Now, in this case, we'll see later, I'll show you in Leviticus, that in cases of making an oath where something can't be proven, when you were at the temple and you were making an offering to God and God convicts your heart later and you've lied to your fellow man about something being stolen from your house or from him, in that case where you voluntarily go and you make restitution where you're not forced to, you only have to pay 20% more, which is a fifth. In cases where you're caught red-handed, you have to restore double. And that's the difference between the fifth and the, the two times. And that's why it says, but if the thief is not found, then the trustee must state before God that he did not take the person's goods himself. He makes an oath. In every case of dispute over ownership, whether an ox, a donkey, a sheep, clothing, or any missing property where one person says, this is mine, both parties are to come before God. And the one whom God condemns must pay the other one double. So if God reveals that this person is wrong, he is taken this, then the person is caught, essentially, by God, red-handed, and he has to pay double. If a person trusts a neighbor to look after a donkey, ox, or sheep, or any animal, and it dies, or is injured, and is driven away unseen, then the neighbor's oath before Adonai that, has not, that he has not taken the goods will settle the matter between them. The owner is to accept it without the neighbor making restitution. But if it was stolen from the neighbor, he must make restitution for the owner. If it was torn to pieces by an animal, the neighbor must bring it as evidence, and then he does not need to make good the loss. If someone borrows something from his neighbor and it gets injured or dies with the owner not present, he must make restitution. If the owner was present, he need not make good the loss. If the owner hired it out, the loss is covered by the hiring fee. 
If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father refuses to give her to him, he must pay a sum equivalent to the bride price for virgins. So in all of these cases, it's about making something right. If you damage somebody's property, you restore it back to its perfect condition. If you borrow a tool, you want to bring it back the same or better condition than you took it in. And so all of these things we can apply to our own day, even though these are just dealing with what they were dealing with in their time. We see in Levit Leviticus 6, the issue of this oath that this man had to take before God, and then he was set free from making restitution. If he took a false oath, and later he's convicted, and he comes back voluntarily, and he makes restitution, he's supposed to add 20% or a fifth. It says, the Lord said to Moses, if anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord, see this key word here, why is he unfaithful to the Lord if he stole something from his neighbor? Because he took an oath using the Lord's name. I didn't do it. And then later he's going to own up to it. By deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen, see it's talking exactly about what we're learning in Exodus, or if they cheat their neighbor or if they find lost property and lie about it or if they swear falsely about any such sin that they may commit. So the whole issue is they're unfaithful to the Lord because they swore falsely, I didn't do that. And the guy says, okay, I forgive you then. Years later, what happens? When they sin in any of these ways and they realize their guilt, they're convicted, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was, now tax collectors would be considered extortion, right? And that's what we're going to see in the case of Zacchaeus. Or what was entrusted to them or the lost property they found or whatever it was they swore falsely about, that's the key issue here, then they must make restitution in full, adding a fifth of the value to it and give it to the owner on the day they present their guilt offering. So you can't come and present a guilt offering to the Lord. You can't be right with God until you make things right with your fellow man. And this is what's not often explained. People don't often correlate what we're learning in Exodus with what Leviticus is talking about. What's the difference between paying double, that's when you're, you go to steal something and you're caught, immediately you need to pay double for what you stole. But if you take an oath before the Lord and there's no proof, they, it's like you're presumed innocent until proven guilty, and then later you're convicted, and after swearing an oath, you come to make restitution. This is when you would add a fifth or 20% to whatever you took. So you steal $1,000, what's 20%? $200 you would need to add to that. So this is for a thief caught in the act or revealed by God, you would pay two times, 200%. If you've sworn an oath falsely about something taken, but convicted, uh, once convicted of your wrong, you voluntarily make restitution, you add 20% to what was taken. Now what's amazing is Zacchaeus was a Jew. He knew Torah, but he's collecting taxes, which is a type of extortion for the Romans, right? And he's living down in Jericho, which is not such a good place to live. And Yeshua is coming up from the Jordan Valley on his way to Jerusalem and passes through Jericho. And Zacchaeus heart is pricked. He wants to see the Savior. And he stood up after coming to Yeshua and he says, look, sir, here now, I'm so convicted. I give half of my possessions to the poor. Now, Yeshua did not say, hey, you've been stealing. He didn't expose him. So he didn't have to pay the double. But he is paying double the double. He's paying as if he was caught red-handed, but doing twice as much as what the Torah asked him to do. He says, here, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. So here he's amassed great wealth. Everything that he has, immediately he's going to start helping the poor with it. And in addition to that, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Yeshua said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost which is beautiful. When we really are convicted, we start living in the most unselfish way. This wasn't profitable for Zacchaeus to give half of his net worth or to pay four times the amount of what he had extorted from anyone. I'm sure there was a big long line of people that came and said, hey, last week you took taxes from me. How much did you add to that? But beautiful. 
So before we get into the um, Hof Torah, we're going to go through the rest of the Torah portion thinking, I want you to think in your own mind, I won't bring it out so specifically as I did in the beginning here, but there's this cycle of laws dealing with accountability, laws of dealing with compensation, and laws dealing with restitution. And I want you to think in your mind as we read each one, what, which one is this? The, all of these are mishpatim, but is it dealing with accountability, how we treat our fellow man, or is it dealing with having done something wrong and making compensation and restitution? Now, the, the subject kind of changes from restitution. In verse 18, you see this accountability coming back up. Now the theme is starting over again. And where are we accountable? Now, instead of it being focused on your fellow man, it's about your accountability to God. You are not to permit a sorcerer to, die, to live. So this is an idol worshiper, a necromancer, a, um, a soothsayer, a palm reader, a fortune teller, <laughs> all of these people who basically channel, uh, channeler, um, demonic spirits. Um, these are called sorcerers. Whoever has sexual relations with an animal must be put to death. See, our bodies are the temple of God. This is an abomination to the Lord. Anyone who sacrifices to any god other than Adonai alone is to be completely destroyed. You must neither wrong nor oppress a foreigner living among you, for you yourselves were foreigners in the land of Egypt. You are not to abuse any widow or an orphan. Be accountable. If you do abuse them in any way and they cry out to me, I will certainly heed their cry, and my anger will burn, and I will kill you with the sword and your own wives will be widows and your own ch children fatherless so see that which you sow you shall also reap is what he's trying to teach them if you are unjust to the widow and the orphan he will make your own family experience what it's like to be widows and orphans if you loan money to one of my people who is poor you are not to deal with him as you would a creditor and you're not to charge him interest if you take your neighbor's coat as collateral, you are to restore it to him by sundown. Be accountable to showing the love to your fellow man, even if he owes you something. Because it's his only garment, he needs it to wrap his body in, in the night. You know, they would use their long garment like a blanket. What else does he have to sleep with? Moreover, if he cries out to me, I will listen, because I am compassionate. And this is what God's ultimately trying to teach us, is how to be compassionate, thoughtful with one another. You are not to curse God, and you're not to curse a leader of your people. You have a thought? <laughs> Lots of <them>. Yeah. <laughs> you are not to delay offering from your harvest of grain, olive oil, or wine. Why not? What does a delay mean? You've reaped a big harvest. Now you're going to go act selfishly, create a big feast for yourself, get drunk. And when you don't attribute that all things come from the Lord, by presenting your grain offering first, it helps you live in a different way, in a way of gratitude, a way of thoughtfulness to God. So this is why we're not to delay even to give our offerings. If this applies to our harvest of grain, which was their form of money in the day, what does that mean to us if we have tithes and offerings that we're supposed to give to the Lord or to help the poor with and we delay and we think, no, I might want to hold back on this. I want a little buffer for myself. It's robbing God. Exactly. It's a type of self-seeking selfishness. The firstborn of your sons you are to give to me. See, all of these are about our accountability to God. When we hold back selfishly, we're robbing God. You are to do the same with your oxen and your sheep. It is to stay with its mother seven days, and on the eighth day you are to give it to me. So people think, well, I might lose out. You know, I'm going to have less sheep, or I don't want to give my children away. But what you don't realize, whenever you apply the principle of selfless love, you give your child to the Lord, like I've given each one of my children to the Lord, and what happens? When you dedicate your children to the Lord, their lives are blessed abundantly. God blesses them more than you could ever bless them if you withheld them from the Lord. And so you're actually robbing not only God, but you're robbing yourself and your children of this blessing. Or in the case of livestock, you withhold the firstborn of the livestock from giving it to the Lord. And what happens? All of a sudden your livestock don't multiply as often. Where if you did give, 
and here you're worried about losing you know a couple livestock amazing blessings come just like with Jacob and the flocks multiplied and you become richer than if you hadn't given so there's a principle of selflessness that you can't outgive the Lord and whatever we do let us fully live by faith giving our all our mind our body our spirit our children our wealth everything to the service of the Lord and he says see that I will not open up the storehouse of heaven and bless you in Malachi in regards to our tithes and offerings he says, you are to be my specially separated people. After all of these laws of accountability to him, he tells us why. And he wants his specially separated people to be not only a light to the nations, but to be such so blessed that the nations are going to want to come to us and say, wow what principles have you been living that you are so blessed i want to know more of this god and his ways and if we would really um, step out in faith and practice these on a selfless level we would be so attractive to the nations therefore you are to not eat any flesh torn by wild animals in the countryside rather throw it out for the dogs there's certain things as god's uh, holy people that we're not to partake in like gossip chapter 23 verse 1 says you are to not repeat false rumors so if you hear something are we supposed to talk about it to each other <laughs> do not join hands with the wicked by offering perjured testimony either so sometimes people will swear falsely in a court of law and perjure themselves do not follow the crowd when it does wrong and don't allow the popular view to sway you into offering testimony for any cause if the effect will be to pervert justice so this is all about testifying truthfully on the other hand don't favor a person's lawsuit simply because he's poor if a poor person has done something wrong he deserves the same justice that a rich person so there's no partiality in verse 4 we see that God is Telling us to uproot all forms of hatred or resentment or bitterness in our own hearts in the way that this is spoken is really unique he says if you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey strain you must return it to him if you see the donkey which belongs to someone who hates you lying helpless under its load you are not to pass him by but to go and help him set it free so the natural tendency with the selfish nature is to say that's this guy that doesn't like me so much look at he's lost his ox or his donkey and you just drive on by and you don't stop your car and you don't help him get it why because you've really got some bitterness in your heart you might be deluding yourself you might be deceiving yourself and thinking oh yeah well I've forgiven him but I'm not gonna help him you know hurt his cattle when they broke through the fence right what God is saying is deal with the hatred in your heart the bitterness it's time to go out and help your enemy and in so doing you fight against your yetzer hara this is the evil inclination that all of us have that that selfish nature that tries to rise up and say uh-huh he's getting his just deserve look at God probably <laughs> is getting you know giving him what he deserves by letting these cows break through the fence for an example but no God is saying you need to deal with this and even if this person hates you and he's your enemy you go it's your responsibility to go and help him set it free and by physically helping him you're helping him spiritually also set free his hatred and there's a beautiful return principle that when he sees the selfless love of God in your action he will be converted Verse 6 says, don't deny anyone justice in his lawsuit simply because he is poor. Keep away from fraud of all sorts and don't cause the death of the innocent and the righteous. This is like our abortion laws. There should be laws against abortion, not for abortion. This is directly against Torah because it's causing the death of the innocent. And this commandment here is one of the four uh, laws that brings judgment upon a whole nation in addition to oppressing the widow and the orphan and laws of homosexuality and bestiality these are laws that uh, bring judgment against a nation he says for I will not justify the wicked 
you are not to receive a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the righteous. You are not to oppress a foreigner, for you know how a foreigner feels since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So time and time again, he's reminding them, you were slaves, you need to have compassion on others the way that you would have desired to see compassion given to you. And this is the same thing that we had just read in the previous chapter, 22, verse 21. Remember what it's like to be slaves or to be foreigners. And so we need to have compassion on people. We were all slaves to sin at one time or another. And sometimes when we see somebody else doing something wrong, we're quick to judge. But we need to have compassion because they're a slave to sin. And we were once slaves to sin, but we were set free. So our job is to not point the finger in judgment or condemnation, but to help be facilitators of Yah's selfless love in showing them how to be overcomers and to help them in being freed from that type of slavery. For six years you are to sow your land with seed and gather in its harvest. But the seventh year, once again we see this millennial principle, you are to let it rest and lie fallow. And the millennium is a type of millennial Shabbat, a time of rest. So that the poor among you can eat, and what they leave the wild animals in the countryside can eat. Do the same for your vineyard and olive grove. For six days you are to work, but on the seventh day you are to rest. He's reiterating the fourth commandment here. So that also your ox and your donkey can rest, and your slave girl's son and the foreigners be renewed. Pay attention to everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the name of other gods, or even let them be heard crossing your lips. Three times a year you are to observe a festival to me. So these are all types of accountability to God still. What are the three feasts, harvest feasts, that we go up and present ourselves, all males in Jerusalem? Pesach, which is Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Yeah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right, Passover. And so both Passover and Sukkot are week-long festivals of ingathering, and Shavuot is the wheat ingathering in between. Keep the festival of matzah, of unleavened bread, for seven days as I ordered you. You are to eat matzah at the time determined in the month of Aviv, for it was in that month that you left Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. So as we remember our slavery in Egypt, why do we eat matzah? Because leaven is a type of um, razor of the bread, of type of... Um, What's another word for leaven? Yeast. Yeah, like the self tries to rise in our lives. So as we remember our freedom from slavery, both physically and spiritually, we also remember physically and spiritually the principles of no leaven in the life, no self, no ego. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Why? If you appear empty-handed, that's because you're thinking selfishly still, right? And you're withholding your offerings before the Lord. So he's teaching you constantly. It's a good thing to be selfless. And the best way to practice this is by giving your offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and your offerings. The festival of Shavuot, the festival of the wheat harvest, the first fruits of your efforts sowing in the field, and the last one, the festival of Sukkot, the festival of ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather in the fields the results of your efforts. Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Lord. You are not to offer the blood of my Pesach sacrifice with leavened bread, nor the fat of my festival to remain all night until morning. You are to bring the best first fruits of your land into the house of Adonai, your God. Remember, when they had sacrificed that lamb and they roasted it on the fire, they had to eat every bit of it, and none of it was to remain until morning. And this was a type of Yeshua's body who would not remain on the cross through the night. All of it was to be used for our salvation, and yet you wouldn't see it in the morning. And then he goes into you are to not boil a young animal in its mother's milk so this is even accountability to our animals just like giving them a rest on shabbat uh, we're also to have compassion mothers should not you know or a mother's milk should not be used to cook its own child this is the principle it's not the principle of eating meat with cheese 
it's the principle of compassion, of understanding where life comes from. It comes from the mother. See, in Genesis, remember when God appeared to Abraham, Abraham served Hashem, the fatted calf, along with curds. So this proves to us that it's not the principle of eating a milk product with a meat product, but that it's the issue of compassion and the source of life. I am sending an angel ahead of you, he says, and now here we see a messianic prophecy or a, a symbol. I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you on the way and to take you to the place that I have prepared. Pay attention to him. Listen to what he says. This is just like the prophecy of Mashiach in Deuteronomy 18, 15, where God says, I am going to send you a prophet like unto Moshe. You shall pay attention to him. Listen to every word he says. And he who does not listen to his words will be accountable to me. See, it's all about accountability. Here he's saying the same thing, but in Exodus, in these laws of accountability. Do not rebel against him. Listen to what he says. Pay attention to him because... He will not forgive wrongdoing of yours since my name resides in him. But if you listen to what he says and do everything I tell you, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. So what does it mean that he will not forgive any wrongdoing of yours if you don't listen to what he says? Those that are claiming that because of Yeshua's sacrifice, they can continue sinning and continue rejecting the Torah, this is saying... He will not forgive those type of wrongdoings. If you don't pay attention to him, the same word is used for the Torah. He says, hear and do. Pay attention to my Torah. Listen to what I'm saying. When he gave the Torah covenant at Sinai, these are the exact words that he's using. And he knew that future generations would try to claim the beautiful sacrifice of the Lamb of God as a justification for continuing in sin, which sin is the transgression of the Torah. So here he's making you very clear, very serious issue. Be sure to pay attention and to listen and don't rebel in any way. What is rebel? Rebellion is any type of self that causes us to do something in opposition to the selfless love of God. Otherwise, you won't be forgiven. There's not going to be any wicked taken into the eternal kingdom. My name resides in him, and this is part of God's justice. If you listen to what he says and do everything I tell you, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. When my angel goes ahead of you and brings you to the Emirai, the Hittai, the Prizai, the Canaanai, the Hivai, and the Yevusai, I will make an end of them. You are not to worship their false gods. You're not to serve them or follow even their practices, their traditions. So we could bring that down to our day today, following the traditions of pagan religions. Rather... You are to demolish them completely and smash their standing stones to pieces. Now, if Israel had followed this Torah law in 1967, when they regained Jerusalem, there would be no issue over the Temple Mount today, and they would be able to rebuild the Temple and hasten Mashiach's coming that much faster. But because they left that standing stone, it is a point of contention and will bring about the final tribulation. You are to serve Adonai your God, and he will bless your food and your water. I will take sickness away from you. In your land, your women will not miscarry or be barren, and you will live out the full spans of your lives. I will send terror, the terror of me ahead of you, throwing into confusion all the people to whom you come. So this is God's original plan that he would use without killing the inhabitants of the land. Remember in another place he says that he would send a horde of bees and that they would flee and he would leave houses that were already built and vineyards already growing for them. He says, I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. I will send hornets ahead of you to drive out the Hivai, the Canaanai, and the Hittai before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year which would cause the land to become desolate and wild animals to become too many for you. I will draw, drive them out from before you gradually as you come into the land until you have grown in number and can take possession of the whole land. What a beautiful plan of God. But Israel did not follow God in taking the land the way he said. He would have given them the land in the very first year that they were in the wilderness. He brought them to the border of the land, but they brought back a false report. Yes. By allowing worship of yes. this day. It's an eternal principle. Yes. 
It's very heavy. And, and this is why I said it will end up bringing the very time of tribulation which could have been avoided. But God doesn't predestine anything to happen. What he's doing prophetically is telling history in advance because he knows the end from the beginning. And so he saw the choices that they would make, how it would lead up to a great time of trouble such as never was. And this is how he was able to hide it in his word through the prophet Daniel and through John and Revelation. All because of this uh, disobedience in this one principle like you said. And we have to ask ourselves, so we have the macrocosm and we have the microcosm. What areas of our life are we still holding on to idol worship or to the traditions of the pagan religions? We want to release it by faith. No, ma no matter how near and dear it's been to us in the past, let's release it and embrace the blessings that God is just waiting to pour out upon us when we step out in faith and follow His Word. He says... I will set your boundaries from the Sea of Suf, this is the, sea, the Gulf of Aquaba, which they had crossed over in the Red Sea, to the Sea of the Philistine, which is the Mediterranean in the west. So here he's saying, down here is the Sea of Suf, okay? And he's telling you, this is how I'm going to bless you if you follow my laws. From the Sea of Suf, which is also called the Red Sea, to the sea by the Philistines. The Philistines lived in this area of Gaza here. All the way up past the map to the Euphrates, that's the original land land grant that God is going to have his people living in and dis distribute according to their tribal regions. He says, you are not to make a covenant with anybody in that area or with their gods. They are not to live in your land. Remember, who are these descendants? These Canaanites are descendants of Ham. Noah had sought God by choosing lots for the three sons that he had, which would get which land. And the lot for this land was fell to Shem and his descendants. But what did Canaan do? Canaan came in and usurped that regardless of God's plan, didn't take his inheritance to the south and stayed there and resided in Shem's territory. So this is an element of self. He's taking it regardless of what God has revealed. He says, they are not to live in your land, otherwise they will make you sin against me by ensnaring you to serve their gods. And this is like one of those boundaries, Mary Ellen, that we were talking about, where it's okay to be separate from people and to set boundaries, because if they're going to continue in their sin, we don't want it to contaminate us or our children or... Well, really, these, these and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. It doesn't it? And it applies across the board back then, today, and tomorrow. And we're going to just keep growing. Yes. You can constantly see that element of, just like we were talking about Canaan versus Shem, self versus selflessness. And it is so simple. This is what I teach children around the world, is every choice. You know, theology, theologians make things so complicated, but really, the gospel is so pure and so simple. And even what we see in Yeshua's sacrifice of total selfless love, every choice that we have to make that starts in our mind, our thought process about it, can be boiled down to, is it for the self alone? or is it selfless? Is it for the good of all? This is what we should ask ourselves about every decision that we have to make in life. Am I doing this for myself at the expense of somebody else? Or is it a choice that's going to bless everyone and glorify God? This is how we should look at every choice in life and then we will see the blessings that God desires to give us. Now in closing, we only look at 18 verses of this chapter 24, and then we will see how the Hoff Torah in Jeremiah 34 correlates with these principles of accountability, compensation, and restitution that we've been looking at. To Moshe, Adonai said, Come up to yod heh vav -Heh, you, Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. Prostrate yourselves at a distance, while Moshe alone will approach me. The others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with him. Moshe came and told the people everything Adonai had just told him with all of these mishpatim, all of these laws of how to live out love to one another, basically. This is what prepared them to be in the presence of God. God first instructed Moses, then he sent him down, taught him how to love one another, to take their thought process higher so that they would be vibrating at a higher frequency so that they could be in his presence, even at the base of the mountain. But Moshe is the only one who's supposed to come into the cloud and approach Adonai. 
Moshe came and told the people everything that Adonai had said, including all the mishpatim. The people answered with one voice. Once again, they said their I do's. We will obey every word Adonai has spoken. This is part of the agreement of the original covenant that God is going to make the firstborn of Israel a kingdom of priests. So Moshe wrote down all of the words of Adonai. So Adonai is giving the oral, the Torah orally, right? Moshe is listening, and then he goes and he communicates it orally. And then he writes down. So the writing down is always secondary to the oral. He rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the base of the mountain and set upright 12 large stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent the young men of the people of Israel to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen to Adonai. Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he splashed against the altar. So he's sanctifying it. Blood always is a ratifier of the covenant. Then he took up the book of the covenant and he read it aloud so that the people could hear and they responded again. Everything that Adonai had spoken, we will do and obey. Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which Adonai has made with you in accordance with all of these words. This is very similar to what Yeshua did. This covenant, shortly thereafter, Israel breaks. This covenant to make his peculiar people a kingdom of priests. And it took the blood of the lamb to restore them back to the original covenant. So this is why Yeshua held up the cup at that final Pesach uh, supper. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which Adonai has made with you in accordance with all of these words. The same thing he's now restoring or renewing the original covenant that had been lost for 1,500 years. Moshe, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and the 70 elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet was something like sapphire stone pavement, as clear as the sky itself. This is the very stone that God took when he cut out the tablets of stone, it says. And you often think of concrete stone, but it's this footstool of the throne, sapphire, that he made the original Ten Commandments and he wrote with his own finger and it could be seen from both sides. It's transparent and it was like fire from within. And in the English, sapphire is understood to be like firestone or the stone with fire within and it comes from this source. He did not reach out his hand against those notables of Israel. On the contrary, they saw God even as they were eating and drinking. So why does it say this? They saw him even as he was eating and drinking. When Moshe would come into the presence of the Lord, would he be eating and drinking? No, total selflessness. This is why I promote fasting and meditation more and more as you grow in your spiritual walk. Why could the 70 elders not come into the cloud with Moshe? They're a little bit further along spiritually than the people of Israel, which are down at the base of the mountain, but they're not as selfless as Moshe. And unless you are vibrating at the same resonant frequency of Yah's selfless love, you can't be in His presence because light eradicates darkness. So here God, it says it, He withheld that amazing glory. It's, they saw Him, but it was like this act of mercy. They, he allowed them to see Him even while they're still feeding the flesh. They're eating and drinking. No one should be eating and drinking unless God commands them to be eating and drinking in His presence. It's like we want to be totally devoid of self. And when you're eating and drinking, what are you thinking about? Feeding the false identity, which is the body, instead of the true identity, which is the Spirit. The Spirit of God gets fed on what? Every word of God. See, when you're communicating with God, you don't need physical food. That spiritual food suffices for both physical and spiritual application. But the physical food, it only suffices for the physical body. And the spirit dies the more you eat physically. So this is another amazing principle of selflessness that these 70 elders didn't quite understand. But God winked at their ignorance and it says they saw God even as they were eating and drinking. Adonai said to Moshe, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there. I will give you the tablets of stone, one, with the Torah, two, and the mitzvot, three, that I have written on them. Okay, so three different things that he's saying I'm going to give you so that you can teach them. Moshe got up, also Yehoshua, his assistant, and Moshe went up onto the mountain of God. To the leaders, he said, stay here for us until we come back to you. See, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a problem should turn to them. 
Moshe went up onto the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of Adonai stayed on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. But on the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the cloud. To the people of Israel, the glory of Adonai looked like a raging fire on the top of the mountain. And Moshe entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. He was on the mountain then 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this is where these Mishpatim end. And next week's Torah portion is called Teruma, dealing, Teruma is different types of contributions or offerings, continuing the aspect or the theme of selfless giving to the Lord and accountability to God. But in closing, I thought we would look at the Haftorah in Jeremiah 34, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 22, and look at, just like what you said, does it still apply today, and what happened later when Israel did not follow these laws? The very first laws he gave them were, you were a slave in I Egypt. I want you to deal compassionately with your slaves. They're not permanent slaves. You're to release them in the seventh year. How did Israel handle this? Israel came to the year, the Shemitah year, and they were told, it's time to release your slaves. So they released them so that the outward appearance, you know how the scriptures tell us that the flesh the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Another place it says that the Pharisees are like whitewashed tombs because they look good on the outside, but inside they're dead. What is this saying? Sometimes we have the appearance of godliness, but not the spirit they're in. Israel released, they gave the appearance of following the Torah, but then they went quickly and they captured them back and took them back in as servants. They weren't really willing to practice that ultimate selfless act of um, freedom and redemption and releasing. So Jeremiah 34 tells us of this prophetically. He says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after that the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them, that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being a Hebrew or a Hebrewist, go free, that none should serve him of them, should serve himself of them. Basically not having any servants that are fellow Jews or Israelites. He's basically proclaiming liberty to the whole land. It's time to release all your Jewish servants that have indentured themselves to you. Now when all the princes and all the people which had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should let his manservant and maidservant go free, that none of them should serve themselves of them anymore, they obeyed and let them go. But afterward... They turned and caused the servants and the handmaidens whom they had let go free to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaidens again. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of Egypt. He's reminding them once again, You were slaves, and I freed you. Why don't you extend to others that same kind of freedom that you've been blessed with? It's the same way that we forgive because we've been forgiven. If you don't forgive someone, it's because you, don't re you haven't really experienced the forgiveness of God. You haven't really believed it. The same thing, he's reminding them that they were slaves. And he took them out of Egypt. And he said, At the end of seven years, let you go, every man his brother, and Hebrew. What he's quoting, he's reminding them of what he had instructed them in his Torah through Moshe at Mount Sinai, what we just read. He's saying, Don't you remember that I told you to release every seventh year those who are in bondage? And when he had served you six years, you shall let him go free. But your fathers hearkened not to me, neither did they incline their ear. Unfortunately, even your fathers didn't follow Torah, and you are not following Torah. So he's speaking to them through the prophet Jeremiah. This is the sin that ultimately caused Nebuchadnezzar to be able to breach the walls of Jerusalem and come and besiege Jerusalem and take slaves because they didn't release their slaves. Guess who got taken as slaves? Daniel his three friends, many others. This is the, what led up to Daniel being taken captive. No foreign entity would be able to capture Israel or Jerusalem unless they had um, broken these laws and removed themselves from that protection of God. Yes? So in essence, not only were they not releasing them, but they were also breaking the commandment where he says, kidnappers must be put to death 
whether they're caught in possession of their victims. Yeah. They basically were forcing them, other scriptures talk about them forcing them into slavery, which is exactly what they're doing. That's they right. They free, but then they forced them to come back. They kidnapped them. A, another commandment they went against. Once they, a good point, once they set them free, these are free men. And to, by taking them by force, you're now committing further sins, just like Jeff had said last week, when you can break the 10th commandment about coveting, you've broken all the other ones. In the same way how this one sin led them to le breaking the other sins, which were more severe and incurred the penalty of death. Very good point. Ye had made a covenant before me in the house, which is called by my name. But you have turned, you have not done right what is right in my sight, in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. You've turned and polluted my name. You've caused every man and his servant and every man his handmaid, whom you have set at liberty, you set them free, you've caused them by force to return. You've kidnapped them and brought them back into subjection to be unto you servants. This is self-seeking. Self is oppos in opposition to selflessness. Selflessness is the source of life. So when you're doing something selfish, you're leading into the principles of death. Therefore, says the Lord, you have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty. Every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty for you, says the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence. Basically, I'm going to give you freedom from your bodies. Since you were so self-seeking, now you're going to have liberty in that you're going to be killed by pestilence and by the sword and by disease. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So this is what caused the diaspora, the beginning diaspora into Babylon. We have to be very careful in how we never use the principle of force against another human being. He says, I will give the men that have transgressed this covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts. When you would make covenant in ancient times, you would cut a calf in half and you would pass between the parts. You see Abraham doing this with the Lord as well. The princes of Judah, and this is including Daniel, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf. These are the people that made covenant. They consciously said, we will follow your words, and now they've broken it. I will give them into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of them that seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of the heavens, and to the beast of the earth. And there's a little correlation between the sins that caused the... Um, exile and the attack from Babylon and so many of those in Jerusalem to be killed and their bodies eaten by the vultures, very similar to the sins in the last days that cause those who are in the Babylonian system to be killed. And remember what it says about the wicked, while the righteous are having a feast in the heavenly sphere, the wicked are, their flesh is being eaten by the vultures, the flesh of kings, captains, and mighty men. So you see a similar parallel. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will I give into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of them that seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which are gone up from you. Behold, I will command, says the Lord, and cause them to return to the city. Now what does he mean, return to the city? In 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had come against Jerusalem. But the temple was not destroyed at that time. It was 20 years later, in 586 BC. Very similar to the Assyrians, which um, in 742, I believe, had surrounded Israel. And then, remember, 186,000 died and they fled away 20 years later because of the sins of Israel. What they couldn't do 20 years before, now they're able to come and capture Israel and the northern ten tribes were carried away. Same thing here when Israel was righteous, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't destroy Jerusalem. But now they're going to come and they're going to return to it and fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. And this is when the Solomon's temple was destroyed. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. 
So we see judgment came as a cause and effect of Israel acting selfishly and not fully embracing the selfless principles that would bring them blessings. They had an outward appearance of godliness, but not an inward heart change towards obedience. And this very principle that we see hidden within the gematria of Mishpatim, leading in our minds to remember the years of the Mishkan, leading up to Solomon's temple that was built, through the sins of breaking these Mishpatim, Solomon's temple is destroyed in the Hoth Torah of this very portion. Amazing how God brings these things all together. So may we, in our pursuit to keep our eyes on the Father and His character of selfless love, pray that we can become changed into that likeness and not just have a head knowledge of His laws and not just say our I do is verbally, but to live out these principles of selfless love in every aspect of our lives. So with that, let's stand and we will close in prayer. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for revealing to us your Torah, your Mishpatim, judgments, and how to love you by loving our fellow man. And we just pray, Father, that you would empower us through your Ruach HaKodesh to be able to live out all of your Torah and to be able to be vessels for your service in selfless love to our fellow man. And we pray that as we see the sins of our forefathers that have rejected your Torah and have not walked in your ways, that it has brought judgment upon them and that they had removed themselves from your blessings and that they experienced the natural cause and effect of their sins that father we would learn from their mistakes and that we would be repairers of the breach and that we would be able to return the lost house of Israel and restore them as one in your hand and that we would be able to corporately return to your Torah and be a light once again to your nations and fulfill what you have desired from the foundation of the world your original covenant that we would be a kingdom of priests to you, Father. This is our desire and this is our heart's prayer. And we thank you for the blood of Yeshua who has enabled us to be overcomers and the power of your Holy Spirit. And we just ask for your blessing upon our lives and we submit ourselves. We dedicate ourselves to you this day and we give of ourselves selflessly our bodies and our minds as vessels for your service. This is our prayer. In your holy name we pray. Amen.